So let's come to these Genesis days. The interpretations are many. I've counted 15 or 16, I think. But they morph into three or four main streams. Number one, the 24-hour view. The days are 24-hour days of one earth week less than 10,000 years ago. Two, the day-age view. The days represent successive periods of time of unspecified length. Three, the framework view. The days are not in chronological order, but they're in a logical order. The first three days representing form, and the second three representing fullness. The sky filled with birds, the sea filled with fish, and the earth filled with animals and human beings. And then there is the view that they are days of revelation, the time during which God revealed it to man. Now, that's a lot to take in at one blush, but I suspect most of you are familiar with this. But one thing I want to illustrate is the difference between logical and chronological order. If you compare Genesis 1 with Isaiah 45, 12, you'll see what I mean. Here's Isaiah. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. If you take that as a chronological statement, it means the earth was made before the heavens. But is it meant to be taken chronologically, or is it meant to be taken logically? When we are describing things, we often mix those two orders, depending on our point of view. So there are these various views. The framework view is one that is very much to the fore these days, particularly the version of it given by John Walton called the Cosmic Temple View. That is, I repeat the idea that the first three and the second three days are in parallel. I would just make a simple observation that the fact that they are in parallel is fairly obvious. But the second thing is, it doesn't mean that there's no chronology. You can't put birds in a sky that's not already there, to put it crudely. So even the framework view has implications of an implied chronology. So that the initial immediate impression is a chronological sequence of events, the briefest, if you like, of brief histories of time. It starts with an earth that is without form and void. There's nothing much there. It ends with the earth full of all kinds of life. And culminating the process is the highest form of life human beings made in the image of God. Let me just stop there. The very fact of a sequence is fascinating. Because it seems to be saying, whatever you believe about the days, that God did not create everything at once. There is a sequence with a goal. And what is the goal? It's human beings made in the image of God. Ladies and gentlemen, our world desperately needs to hear this today. Human beings are the only creature or thing in the entire physical universe that are said to be made in the image of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. It is nowhere said they were made in his image. You were made in God's image. And that distinguishes you above every other creature. You don't need me to remind you that in America and in the United Kingdom today, there is enormous pressure to devalue human beings to just another species. And before we get into the details here, just let's see what this text is actually saying. It's saying that you, as a human being, are uniquely valued. Because you are made in the image of God. That is an immensely powerful and important message. So there's a sequence of days and a rest, which becomes, of course, the model of our earth week. But now comes the key question. What does Genesis actually say? Well, first of all, the word day, which is the crucial issue here. Well, the first mention of it in chapter 1 is verse 5, where we read, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So what's the length of that day? Not 24 hours. By definition, it isn't. I find it spectacularly amazing, ladies and gentlemen, 
that people can read this text and insist that in every place where the word day in Genesis or the Bible occurs, it means a 24-hour day. The very first use doesn't. It contrasts day with night. And that reminds us of the multivalency of the word day in most languages. I came on Tuesday in the day. It's not saying the same thing twice. It's saying I came in the daytime. So the very first use of the word is the contrast between the 12 hours, at the equator at least, of day and night. So number one is not a 24-hour day. It's actually less. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the second occurrence is in the same verse. Day one involves evening and morning and would be naturally understood by Hebrews as what we would think of as a 24-hour day. So now we have two meanings for the word day, but there are more. We come to the seventh day, the Sabbath. There's no mention of evening and morning. And for centuries, people have asked why. And Augustine and many others made the sensible suggestion that God rested on the seventh day, but he didn't start creating again. That that Sabbath rest, has remained until today and is still going on. And hence, the word evening and morning is not appended to it. So there's at least one very long day that I find millions of Christians believe in anyway, without necessarily being aware of it. So the seventh day, arguably at least, is different from the first six, which is different from the first mention of the word day. God, of course, rested from his work of creation, not from his work of redemption. That is a different matter and is very important. But ladies and gentlemen, the implication of God resting from his work of creation, that is immensely important. Because it means that things were going on during creation that aren't going on anymore. So that the present is not a total key to the past. Now, of course, that is dynamite in certain academic circles, but I'm simply trying to see what scripture is saying. It's saying that God did certain things and he stopped doing them. There was a rest. But then finally, in Genesis 2 verse 4, we meet the expression, when God created. But the word when there is the Hebrew word for day. And you see, here is now another use of the word day that we've all got. You know, in my young day at Cambridge, C.S. Lewis was a professor. You would never think of asking me, was that Tuesday or Wednesday? <laughs> because day there is an expression, <coughs> excuse me, for an indefinite period of time, isn't it? It's used in Hebrew in that way. It's used in most languages in that way. So now, looking at this fascinating text, we have several distinct meanings. They're all primary meanings, and they're all different. Now, this text is roughly 100 words, and here's a word used in five different senses which warns me that this is extremely sophisticated writing. It may be very simple on the surface, but there's a sophistication to it that begins to emerge very rapidly. So how should we interpret all that? Well, the next point to make, I think, is this. Verses 1 and 2 of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and so on. Those two at the beginning are separated from the period of days. I find many people haven't noticed that. Because every day from 2 on begins with, and God said. So you would logically expect that day one begins with, and God said, but that means that it's verse three and not verse one. In other words, the creation of the heavens and the earth, however you interpret the days, according to the text, did not occur on day one. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Because if that is the case, and the Hebrew experts whom I have consulted tell me that the Hebrew changes the tense to make that extremely clear, that verses 1 or 2 are written in such a way as to indicate this occurs before the main narrative, is a sequence of days. 
Well, you say, now, let's get down to it. You just told us, evening and morning, day one, day two, that's a 24-hour day. That's exactly what I said, ladies and gentlemen. But now let's think again. Because there's another little thing. If you look at a Bible, you usually see the first day, the second, the third, the fourth. That's not what the Hebrew says. Hebrew has a word for the, hayom, the day. It's not used for days one to five. It's only used for days six and seven. That's intriguing. Because you see, if you were thinking of a normal earth week, you would either have them all without the article or have them all with the article. You certainly wouldn't go not the first day, but day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, the sixth day, the seventh day. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because, you see, if we just think back, suppose you only at this page of Scripture. Forget science, forget everything else, just use logic on it and try to understand it. It's saying there is a sequence of days. We can presume they're 24-hour days, evenings and mornings. One, two, three, four, five, six, they're in sequence. And they're days in which, and God said. But nothing in the text demands that they're days of a single earth week. They're the creation days on which God spoke. So here's a possibility. I wouldn't die for this, you know, although some of you might want me to die for it before I go tonight. <laughs> But I'm only making a suggestion that opens up a vast possibility that what these days are is what they claim to be. God spoke. It didn't take him long to speak, if I might put it that way. And God said. And something happens. It might have taken a very long time for the potential of all of that to develop. And then sometime later, God speaks. And then sometime later, he speaks again. Which means, of course, that if there are any traces of this to be found, we would expect to find what we do find, the sudden appearance of new levels of complexity. Now, might I now make a very provocative statement? And I'm coming now to the end, because I've got a stop clock here. Mine, not his. And what I want to say is this, ladies and gentlemen. Genesis says very little, and the Bible says very little about how God did it. But what it does say is very important. Let me give you the New Testament version of it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him. That is through the Word. It's talking about existence. How you get something from nothing. They came to be through the word. Now listen to the unpacking of that in Genesis 1. And God said the word. And God said, and God said. And there are two days on which God speaks more than once. I hope you've noticed that. On day three and day six. And on day three, fascinatingly, it's to make the difference between what we would call the inorganic and life. Now I'm going to word myself very carefully. In scripture, you do not get from inorganic materials to life without and God said. On day six, animals and human beings. You do not get from animals to human beings without and God said. Might I point out, however obscurantist it may seem, that is the exact opposite of random unguided evolution, ladies and gentlemen. Thank <laughs> you.